Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash heroes, villains, and sidekicks. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Episode 32, my interview with Brian Haberlin. Hi, and welcome to the Heroes, Villains, and Sidekick show. You might have noticed, since Brian Haberlin is not a hero, villain, or a sidekick, well, he's one of my heroes, but he is uh, an actual person. He is a comic book creator. Uh, And when I say comic book creator, I'm not, I'm talking all aspects of comics, writing, coloring, art, uh, and now he is doing these amazing comics like uh, Anomaly and Faster Than Light, and we talk about others, where he's using augmented reality, where it isn't just a comic book anymore. It's it's these these pages in the comic will have uh, an area on them where you'll download the app and you'll point it at the comic, and 3D models will come up of different ships or vehicles or people or, you know, extra story. And he actually talks about, Brian actually will be talking about some new projects he's working on where the 3D aspect and the augmented reality aspect will actually start to drive and determine the story. It was really just an interesting talk. Uh, I've been a huge fan of Brian Haberlin for a long time, going back, you know, all the way back to Top Cow Days and and Witchblade. So I I think you're really going to like this interview because, again, Brian's been in comics and working in the industry and in the TV industry forever. And he's just an interesting guy. And just, you know, uh, again, I'm always honored when a working professional will take the time out of their day to do an interview for the show. And Brian did just that. So again, I really think you're going to dig this episode. And another really fun thing about this interview is when I do my calls and my interviews like this, I do them in Skype. And Brian actually had his video on, so we actually recorded video during this. So if you head over to the site, heroesvillainsandsidekicks.com, you can actually watch this interview and see us. And, and one thing's pretty cool because we're inside, you know, Brian, one of Brian's studio areas, and he'll actually go in one point in the interview and get a little 3D model he's working on. So definitely head over to the site, heroesvillainsandsidekicks.com, to check that out. And while you're on the web, maybe watching that episode, go ahead and head over to iTunes. Again, really looking to get some more of those uh, iTunes reviews. If you could just head over there and leave a quick review, take a few seconds, and uh, this way others will you know, get to know about our cast. It'll sort of move it up the, the iTunes ranking system. So again, head over there to iTunes and check that out and leave us a review. Also, if you'd like to hear about someone on the show, a character or an artist or professional, if I can get an interview with them, head over to, again, heroesvillainsandsidekicks.com, and right at the top of the page, there's a big yellow box next to the most current episode, and it says, leave a message. And if you click on that, you can actually leave me a voice message. You heard it in the Wild Dog episode, and uh, you can leave a message who you want to hear. You could leave your name, and then I'll mention you on the air, and I'll do research on that character, and you will go ahead and uh, hear your voice on one of the next episodes. So, again, head over to the site, heroesvillainsandsidekicks.com, to watch my interview with Brian Haberlin, and also see a bunch of images and some really cool video of just what we're talking about when we mention and we talk about augmented reality. So, without further ado, my interview with Brian Haberlin. I want to welcome uh, Brian Haverland to the podcast. How are you doing, Brian? I'm doing good. How are all you podcasters? <laughs> yeah, we're all, uh, we're, there's so many podcasts. I listen to tons of podcasts. Yeah. Yeah, I love them. Um, so first, my first introduction to you was actually uh, back when you were doing comic uh, work with Top Cow. Mm-hmm. And give me a uh, What's a little, that seems like it was like a million years ago, the whole Top Cow. <laughs> About, I believe we're doing a 25th anniversary uh, pretty quick oh my on goodness. that one. So what pretty was that like jumping into Image when it was just starting out like that and Top Cow and creating characters? <clears throat> well, it was, it was, it was, you know, I, I consider myself incredibly fortunate to be able to start when I started because it was a very unique experience because, uh, you know, Image had just been formed. 
Mm-hmm. Um, it was the only image studio that had more than one studio in it when it started. It was down in San Diego and Mira Mesa. So Top Cow was in the same offices as Wildstorm, as right. the same offices as Wills. Um, and everybody else was pretty much, you know, Todd was, was at that time up in Portland, I want to say. Um, and Eric was, I think, you know, I think he's always been in the Berkeley area and, and, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> Rob was, uh, up in Anaheim. Uh, and, uh, it was a big open floor plan. Uh, there were only two closed offices that are offices that had doors, I should say. Um, you could walk around the studio, you could sit behind Scott Williams while he was inking, as long as you're not a dick and, uh, and absorb, uh, you couldn't walk around by Mark while he was drawing Jim. We had the brand new kids in the block that were there were like, uh, Jeff Campbell just starting. We had, we had we had guys. What was really interesting too back then is Mark actually had kind of like a farm team. So he would bring people on board before they were ready. And when there was like the top cow sort of <clears throat> condo that they could stay in for free, you know, and and come into the studio every day and work. And they'd come into the studio and they'd be drawing all day. And they wouldn't be drawing on a book. They would be drawing to get better. That was. You know, Joe Benitez, that was Billy Tan, that was, you know, Dave Finch, that was all these people that were there working for, in some cases, months before, okay, now you're, 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 you're ready to, to go. You yeah, know? It was like an apprenticeship. Yeah. And then, you know, the other great thing was, and you know, I got to work with, you know, I mean, just masters, you know, right off the bat, you know, Joe Chido is like, you know, I learned all, you know, so much color from Joe. I mean, cause I was always, you know, I was, I, I got hired the year before San Diego comic con. I was working in television at the time. Uh, my wife was working in television too. And she was like, you know, get me out of here, you know, and, 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 and every year you know, I developed a bunch of new computer techniques to do stuff and uh, on my own. And then, you know, every year I'd go down with my portfolio in hand, like everybody else and stand along lines. And, and the one thing that most people need to know is that the guy usually who's doing a portfolio review at, at a convention is the low man on the totem pole. He got stuck doing the portfolio review, not the guy who, right. So, you know, I, you know, every year after year that, and then a buddy of mine, Rod Underhill, said, hey, I'm going to have a booth at San Diego, you know, in the small press area. You want to split it with me? You know, and it's like, yeah. OK, let's try that for a change. Right. So I had a big, you know, back when the old monitors were were deeper than they yeah, were wide. CRT, you know? yeah. yeah, big, huge CRT with a fully animated uh, 3D model of Spawn coming down to the floor with this cape draping on the floor. I had this big uh, green lantern that I penciled and inked and, and colored and had a big 3D model power battery behind him and 3D model green angel wings behind him, you know, on a big ink chip print behind me. And everybody and their mother came by and offered me work. <laughs> and, I couldn't get, and I couldn't get work as a comic artist the year before if I, you know, shot somebody. Well, and that's the thing <laughs> with, with your work is like you've always, it seems like you're, you know, penciling, coloring, the 3D work. I mean, is it always, is it, have you always just sort of been interested in all facets of the the medium? Yeah, I mean, I've been actually a professional illustrator since I was 18. Mm -hmm. And I actually had my first job offer, actually, to go pencil at Marvel when I was 18. And I went to film school instead. Oh. John Romita Sr. and and Jim Shooter offered me. It was actually going to be being one of Romita's Rangers, you know, thing and stuff. But they wouldn't, you had to move to New York, and I'm a California boy. You had to, uh, they, it would be $35 a page, you know, and, you know, I, I, I kind of didn't feel like starving. <laughs> <laughs> New York on $35 a page. I don't <laughs> so I went to film school instead and always did illustration stuff professionally on the side. But that was, but that was also kind of the negative when I first went in there because my samples were all pencil ink and color, mm-hmm. right? And at that time, nobody or very few people did pencil ink and color, right? And it was like, okay, what do you want to be? <laughs> it's like, what do you want to do? You know, and and you know, I considered you know, the first offer was from Mark, and it was to come and and you know, and start his coloring department and all that stuff. And it was, and I figured, you know, it's it's a foot in the door, right? Right. You know, the problem yeah, I had well. though is I got pretty good at it pretty fast, and it was very hard for me to then. Okay, now I want to move on to write and and pencil and and do that kind of stuff. Now it's like. No, 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 no. We want you coloring. <laughs> you know? So you got to be careful. The foot in the door sometime can be, you know, 
a little bit of an issue if you get too good at what you got the push, foot in the door for. Uh, so now you now you were, went there to sort of set up the color uh, the coloring department. Yeah. Now yeah, when I, when I went there, it was it was I mean, Tough Cow was myself, yeah. Mark, David Wall. That was pretty much it. Wow. You know, and then and Joe, I think you, Joe Benitez was there at the time. And what were you using, and what did you sort of what was your setup for coloring then? Um, they were, you, you couldn't do it. On, I, I was always a PC. I mean, I started as a mega guy, you know, cause again, I was always about more like what had the best horse power and what could do what I needed yeah. to do. I really, I had no brand loyalty whatsoever. Right. And, um, whatever's got horsepower and whatever can run the software I needed to run. Great. So after the Amiga that went to PC, you know, um, because, PC was more affordable. There was a lot more stuff going on for it and stuff yeah. like that. But they were not as powerful as the Max because back then I think we were stuck with like a 16-bit architecture on the on the on the PC still. Even though technically the CPUs could be faster, there was such a bottleneck between memory and the CPU that you had to go with Max. And that was actually an interesting sort of. Uh, it was an interesting period of time in that. Um, Technology was a was a barrier to anyone doing their own computer work because you had to basically spend ten thousand dollars to have a machine that was powerful enough to color a freaking comic book page mm-hmm. at the time. Um, so that's why you didn't see, I think, a lot of you know individuals coloring in the early days, especially yeah, in the computer. Scary, yeah. But we had to figure all that shit out anyway. It's like no one knew. I mean, we 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 you know between John Nee and myself, we figured out you know. How, how you had to do color separation properly for this stuff, how to use the Photoshop files in the right way, how to do trapping, how to do all this stuff that people didn't know how to do. It was new, yeah. you know? And this is super early version of Photoshop. So there's, were there even we layers were, in that one? I believe we, we were, we, we were 2.5 to start. Wow. And maybe three. Wow. And we used to have to, you know, there were a lot of things. We, we were also stupid. We, we didn't know that, you know, color is much more pliable than, than, than line art. So we used to color you know, full res pages. So 300 DPI back then, 11 by 17. And, and that would just, I mean, there were, there were, uh, Ben Fernandez was one of the early Wildstorm colorists and Jim was doing, you know, playing with these like five page gatefold things, you know? And, and back then, if you had a 300 pixel airbrush, uh, and we're doing it. So he had big, huge gatefolds, big whole things going across. Right. And Ben had to, to, to do, you know, airbrush going across yeah. and you go foom on, on your, on your, uh, big, huge, giant Wacom tablets, by the way, like this big, you know, um, and, and we used to call them digitizers back then. Um, but it would, the, the brush would go chunk, 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 oh, chunk, <laughs> chunk, 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 chunk. You know, uh, it was definitely, uh, it was definitely the primitive time in, in comic book production. That's for sure. So, like, what was um, your one of the first books you started working on where you got to do some some writing or break out of the coloring at, at Top Gun? Um, the very first thing was was really um, uh, ballistic with Mike Turner. Okay, okay. I, um, I was friends with Wells, and Mike was getting to the place where Mike needed a book to do, you know, and I wanted to write something. And Mark was hot with uh, Ballistic, who was, you know, one of the female characters from Cyberforce. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, why don't we, you know, I'll grab Wilson's Wetworks and we'll team them together and we'll do a, a story that way. And then yeah. let Mike really kind of cut his teeth, you know, on something he, he kind of really wants to do. And so we did a three-issue three issue miniseries, I believe. And Ballistic. When did- Ballistic. I do remember the covers of those. I, I've got. They're beautiful, boy. I had my, I had, <laughs> I built a heck of a coloring team at that point too. I had Richard Eisenhoff. I had Steve Furcow. I had Ashby. I had the best of the best, you know. And 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 it was a time too where we didn't have to. I mean, in modern comics, most coloring is done. You know, most guys who have to color books these days. I mean. God, it, it, it's just a hellish profession. It, it's it's uh, here's ten pages. We need it tomorrow, by the way. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, know. <laughs> back then we had a team of guys, and we could say, okay, 
spend a day on that page. Yeah. Yeah. Kick, kick ass on that wow. page, you know, and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And that's what we can, and that was also how I started, you know, it is when I first started coloring stuff, I know it's fast doing this stuff to start. And I was slow as molasses and, you know, Mark was of the opinion, you know, it'll go out when it's ready. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, why I'm so fascinated with the coloring is like one of the first times I, well, I got to, I, I don't, I wouldn't say work with you, but uh, I took one of your online coloring courses. Like, I don't know when that was. Nineties? <laughs> I don't know. Late nineties? Early two thousand? Yeah. I cannot yeah. remember. I was yeah. in North Carolina, and it was, and it was. Uh, you know, we couldn't do this kind of thing. You know, you yep. would do some tutorials. You'd send them to us. We'd work on it. We'd send them yep. back. Yep. And uh, I learned a lot. I just Thanks. remember, yeah, because I went from there to then doing some stuff with some coloring groups that were out there that Laura uh, Martin at the time was in, like yep. the Colorists Unite and everything. And, yeah, when you're talking about 10 pages in a couple of days, I, I did some coloring for Brian over at Hi-Fi and mm-hmm. some stuff for Oni. So, yeah, that's what it's like. You don't When I hear, here's a page, work on it for the day, that would yeah. be nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not yeah. going to happen. Yeah. No, so, yeah, I mean, and even then it was, like, so slow. I still remember it's like, I think there was because because what kind of eventually crept in was you know the bubble started to burst right and then you know when you had books that were selling five hundred thousand copies and all of a sudden the book would be returnable if you didn't make that deadline anymore you know then I mean there were times when we were we were flying Cyquest drives up to uh, Canada to the printer wow you know it'd be that close on some of this stuff you know we'd be up there Cyquest drive you know stick it in and then just keep our fingers crossed that it would make it because it would be the difference between a book, you know, potentially losing $200,000 or making an extra $200,000. So wow. yeah, you're going to get your butt on a plane to Canada and you're going <laughs> to get that to the printer. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Now at what point did, um, I know you're also the co-creator of Witchblade. When did, when did that happen in, in the time? That, that was around 94. Um, uh, and, uh, and it was when, you know, uh, yeah, I came from TV. I was doing TV uh, development and uh, current programming and stuff for like five years. I started at Lorimar Television, and then we eventually became Warner Brothers Television. Uh, we're done dozens and dozens of shows. So I, I, I wanted to bring a TV development approach to doing a new comic property. And at the time, the hot comic book properties were she were Brian and, you know, Billy She and, and, and Brian's uh, Lady Death, you know, and they were selling mm-hmm. gangbusters. And it was like... You know, I think we should need to do our, you know, I'm not going to say our bad girl because that was never our, our moniker with that stuff, though that became a moniker for those those characters at the time. Uh, let's do our female lead, you know, and let's yeah. give her a job and, and let's, you know, and, and, and let's figure out how we could keep generating stories all the time. And David and I went down to the Santa Monica career, David Wall, and we started bouncing it all back and forth back and forth you know first maybe we should she be a fireman maybe you know and that was kind of playing for a little while but a fireman doesn't doesn't get in the in in quite as many sort of dramatic death on the line situations right. and, and double dealing and backstabbing that a detective would of course you know so then over being a detective you know and david and i always had a fondness for the michael moorcock sort of you know eternal champion you know Stormbringer and stuff the weapon that is on your side, but not necessarily always on your side, that it's got its own motivations and its own things, which, you know, really kind of hadn't been done in comics at the time. And and then once we kind of, okay, this is kind of what it is, let's bring it back in, and we brought it back in. And again, Michael was just, I mean, after Ballistic, he was ready to explode. You know, he really, he just kept getting better and better and better. I, I love Mike, because Mike actually, we had, we, had, we had the kind of same approach too, because he was, you know, he was a competitive kickboxer back in the day. Um, and uh, and we both approached art in a athlete, ath- like we're going after uh, an athletic performance. It's like we're training, we're doing, you know, all those things. We're, we're basically lifting weights. You know, lifting weights is life drawing for an artist. You know, doing all that stuff, exposing ourselves to everything you possibly could. And, you know, Mike just, was doing that, you know, and it's okay. Mike's obviously our guy for the art, you know, and then Mark came in and with his wisdom was putting in, oh, well, what about this or this and this? And that's how it went. Yeah. Big collaborative project. Uh, when you're in a studio, you've got that, you know, you've got all yeah. these hands you can draw on and make the product better. And then of course, TV show. 
Yep. Which I remember. I used to love that show. Yep. Yep. And it, and it really, I mean, and the, the, the kind of ironic thing there was really was built for, uh, you know, it was built, she was built to not have to just be her, you know, it was built that they could be passed on to the next person. So in Doctor Who kind of fashion, you could keep it rolling. But there were, you know, problems with her and there was problems with the production company was charging too much for TNT for the show. So even though it was doing decent ratings and stuff, it became such a pain in the ass for TNT. They decided rather than, dude, you can recast and you can, you know, it's like, you know, whatever, you know, I, I think, I think now that the, 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 the most development execs are a little smarter about that kind of stuff than they were back then, you know, because there weren't really, I mean, you know, a lot of, because even then it was like, a tough time to pull off a good superhero thing with meaning effects and all that kind yeah, of yeah, stuff. Yeah. You know, it just the, wasn't there the, so the, the tendency would have been back then to, you know, throw people in the spandex and okay, there you go. You know, and then I, I still remember there were many meetings where we were, I mean, when we were, when I was at Lorimar, we actually went spawn, like the first issue sold, I want to say eight or five million copies, something like that, right? And and me and 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 the exec I was working working with went into Les Moonves's office and said, you know, you got you got to do Spawn. This is the biggest comic book ever. And he's like, yeah, okay. So how much is this selling? It was like we said, you know, eight or five million or whatever. Whatever he said, he goes, that's a terrible rating. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to hold different scale. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, the um, the newest thing that you've been working on. Um, well, I just read it. I know it's up to a uh, higher number. Is faster than light. Yep. And one of the things that is just amazing about that. Well, it's also you did Anomaly too, which was one of the lar- Wasn't it the largest graphic novel? Longest, longest original full color. Yeah. Uh, Throwing full color in there, uh, graphic novel, uh, and then we have number two of that's coming out in August. Cool. Oh, fantastic! That yeah, is August, huge. and it will be exclusive to the comic book market for the first two months, and then it will go wide into the bookstore market. Okay, and I think one of the amazing things is about we could talk about Anomaly. One of the most amazing things to me about Anomaly is a it is so large and the color is amazing and the the story is great, but it's also uh, has augmented reality. Yeah. Well, so does faster than light. So uh, and so does faster than light. Yeah, yeah. Both of them do. So, uh, if for people out there who don't know, what is uh, the ultimate augmented reality that you sort of build into the books? So, with all of our titles from Anomaly, Shifter, um, oh, Shifter uh, yeah. Between Worlds, which was our young adult novel that came out last year that my partner wrote, uh, and then Jana Clato and myself did some of the illustrations for. Um, you point your Apple or Android device at a page with the art. Uh, the app itself will tell you which pages are active, and the characters will be, literally pop off the, the screen. But they will also do things like we have ones where you can just simply you know, point at a page, and if you slide the slider, it will slide between layouts to pencils to final color, so you can actually see that stuff. So the interactivity is not just that. It's also games. We have on the cover of the second trade of Faster and Light is my favorite one. We actually have an Asteroids game with the Discovery. Full-blown retro Asteroids game. Well, I'm going to get that out. It is in the, my pile of to read back there, so I need to... And then we have stuff like on, on Anomaly 2, we're, we're reaching out and we're having... Uh, we're having there's going to be one page that's going to have these two empty screens on it, and when you put the uh, the app on it, you get to pick which characters you want to interact with each other, and they'll have start a conversation. Oh, my God. That and then we amazing. also have two in this... Because we have sketchbook material stuff in Anomaly 1, but this time we have sketchbook material where you see the finished sketch, you put up your iPad and it's drawn in front of you. That is, that is fantastic. And then there's also like in the first anomaly, there's about a hundred extra pages of appendix information that's mm-hmm. in that app. So there's full, it's not, just, it's not just interactivity. There's also all this data on the character or the ship or the planet or yeah. whatever the deal is. You're getting, you know, authors, authors notes and yeah. uh, DVD commentary type thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, I showed some uh, – I used to show uh, – well, I not used to. I do. I teach a class, too, in uh, communication design, communication mm-hmm. arts. So I bring Anomaly in and, you know, hook my phone up to the screen and show them and it just blows their mind. Uh, they're like, oh, I didn't think – you know, 
they've seen it here or there, but they've never seen it where it isn't just used for a gimmick. It, it can be used to help tell the story, to get yeah. more information. And that's yeah. what I like that you guys do. You don't just say, look at this well, little that, 3D thing flying around. Well, that's that's where it's even going to go farther in uh, one of the new books we're working on, Fury Formula, which is sort of a modern take on uh, Jekyll and Hyde mythos. Oh. And uh, in that, when you point it at a couple pages in the book, you'll actually then get the the point of view of the other aspect of the character. So in the story in the comic, you're with the guy normally, right? Then you get the hide version of the uh, of the page and what's going on. That is such a good idea. <laughs> I cannot wait for that. I will definitely. Be be the first, this will be the first one where we'll actually literally impact the story, where the other ones are more. It's always like cool adding stuff and or cool, like you said, like DVD extras on steroids and you know games and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's it's definitely more icing on the cake than the cake itself. There's going to be more cake. In yeah. Fury. And now, I mean, so we've got people, you know, writing, drawing, uh, coloring, you know, design. Is there a whole other team that you have that's just working on the 3D stuff, or is it everybody together? Yeah, really. Um, uh, for the app stuff, my strong right arm uh, is, is, is David Pence, uh, who is actually my uh, started as my assistant way way back in uh when i started my first coloring when i first left top call and started uh my coloring studio um and uh and he's just one of those guys who's just a, a technological genius you know he's one of those guys that i could always say i don't have time to figure this shit out you go figure it out you know and we'll go from there um and uh and really the rest of it is is the techniques i've developed are so fast now that it's really mostly mostly me at the moment with assistance yeah so i'll, I'll get have you know 3d i'll set up i'll have layouts then to an assistant and script and they'll kind of get things generally where i need them and then i'll finish it off you know i, I mean i know the amount of work that goes into just doing a straight comic yeah straight one we just finished hold on one second right back. sure hold on, hold on. Look, sing to your fans. Sing to somebody. Do something. Make some noise. <laughs> well, let's look at the prints that are behind Brian. They are quite amazing. I'm wondering if they're watercolor. No, they're, are they oils or acrylics? Because they're going off of the frame. Very, very cool. Uh, I follow him. If you don't follow him on Facebook, follow him on Facebook. Because he puts, posts a lot of drawings. <laughs> so this is like oh, a model that just nice. did uh, that is nice. Now, is it 3D print or? Yep, that's off our three off our form labs. It's oh, got a incredible. little brass paint on it, and then uh, a patina. Yeah, that oxidizing liquid that'll yeah. that'll bronze it. Now, have you ever fooled around with any um, of the metallic uh, 3D filaments? Uh, yeah, you know what? Um, uh, my MakerBot goes down so often. Uh, <laughs> I, I really pretty much am only using or mostly using my form labs these days. So oh, the resin. So it's a resin yeah. flow. Yeah. 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 I'm actually just ordered one. I'm waiting for it to come in uh, a 3d printer. It's a, I don't know. What is it? A CR 10. I've been hearing people have been saying it's a, a good base printer. So I'm looking yeah. forward to trying it out. But, uh, so that is why. So you're working on the books. You say, Oh, I want to 3d print this character and you can just put a character out like that and take a look at it. Yeah, and then we're, you know, again, with all the new stuff we're planning, you know, with like Fury Formula and the new books, we're, we're planning on doing four new titles a year, uh, starting from this point, you know, um, and comics, mostly. Um, but the idea, too, is now to really, since we can do this stuff, yeah. and we can do, we, we have casting and molding stuff, in the, so we can make multiple copies of these things, too, once we have them. It's very easy these days. Using these as, as incentives for retailers, using these as extra things to sell at shows, you know, I think it allows a little company like mine to really stretch out much wider with this stuff. Yeah. You you know, know, you're sort of being a little toy company at the same time as being a little comic company. Yeah, you don't have to try to source out and print 500 statues yeah. or you know you can 20 for a show and yeah no i was i mean i don't know if you saw the video of uh, what i was doing and i'll be doing at chicago con too is i have these press molds where i can take clay yes. live in front of some angle boop, 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 pop out there you go here's your and they're not there because they're press mold they're all a little unique and all a little different yeah. you know? 
Um, and, and I, I think that's pretty fun. Yeah. Well, I really, I want to, uh, I want to thank you for uh, joining me today on the call. I really appreciate sure. it. Uh, I've been, like I said, I've been following your coloring and your art and now your the 3d stuff for so long. And, uh, it's been really nice to get to talk to you. Thanks. Nice to talk to you, Kevin. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Brian. Again, great fun. I'm working on lining up more interviews. Again, head over to the site, heroesvillainsandsidekicks.com, and you can even leave me a message on an, an artist or a colorist or writer you'd like to hear from, and I will work as hard as I can to get the interview. You might be wondering, you know, Kevin, how do you get interviews for the show? I email people. I bug them on Facebook. I tweet at them. I try to get them on the show for you, the listener, and for me, myself, because I love talking to creators. So again, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you get a second, head over to iTunes and leave a review. I really appreciate it. And as always, we'll be back next week with more. Take care. Take care.